Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back. It's been two years since my last uh, hack fast. So uh, my name is Adenilson Cavalcante. I work for ARM. I'm based in San Jose. Hi. Uh, so my name's Dave. I'm here with Adenilson. And uh, we've also got Jack <laughs> along with us. So we've got a talk in three parts today. Um, we are going to very briefly talk about what we've done to bring the web to some new platforms, uh, specifically to Windows and ARM. Then I'm going to hand over to Adelson, who's going to talk about the work the team's done to do some optimization work in Chromium. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some upcoming hardware features in the ARM architecture that can be used to secure the browser um, sort of all the way up the browser stack. So start off with a quick uh, update on Windows and ARM. So there's a bunch of new Windows and ARM devices that are kind of coming onto the market. Um, so this is example. Um, and the performance is great uh, unless you have your browser emulated. Um, so one of the things we've done is we've done a quite a bit of porting work on Chromium to get it building natively out of the box. And that gives you about a uh, 2.4 times uh, speed up on speedometer. And uh, based on Chromium, we've also looked at the Electron and Ceph application frameworks. So people who are using those to build apps based on Chromium web technologies uh, can get native builds that perform well on Windows and ARM. So as an example of that, we ported Visual Studio Code. Uh, so this is a native build. Uh, it's all obviously Chromium based. So most of it's written in JavaScript, um, more or less kind of effectively running in a browser. And that's, that's native now on Windows and ARM. All right, so I'll hand over to Adelson to talk about optimization. I think it, it, it is on? Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so let's talk about browser optimizations, which I think is uh, really exciting. Okay, so two years ago, that was like a, the last slide of my talk, where I mentioned some of our next plans, the stuff we we're planning to get done. And basically, they were like... Um, upstream into the PNG uh, patch to the upstream project. Also implement an optimized CRC32 checksum using the ARM great crypto extensions, which I thought back then would be about 10 times faster. Fix also uh, a corner case when you are decompressing some content and start working towards uh, optimizing compression. So good news are Two years later, we got everything done. So uh, the palette optimization is part of libpng. I implemented the CRC32 optimization, and I was actually wrong. It wasn't 10 times faster. It was actually 20 times faster. And we also fixed the corner case, and compression got done like last year. And wait, there's more. Uh, Android now is using a Chromium Zlib. And what is missing is just to enable the optimizations. So I hope to get that done in the next couple of weeks. All right, so let's have a look on some numbers. So on this, we have two charts here. One shows like um, what is the effect of the optimizations for decompression, which would be like the red dots, and the effect of optimizations for compression, which would be the blue dots. So, as an example, if you look on, say, HTML, that would be 75% faster than, say, vanilla uh, Zlib on 32 bits. And for 64 bits, that would be about 2.2 um, times faster or 120% uh, faster than, say, uh, vanilla Zlib. Of course, depending on the entropy level of your input file, may have different results. 
also depending uh, on the behavior of say the SOC where testing you may also have some different results but what was really nice is that uh, the optimizations they worked across the board with different uh, data as also both on 32 bits and 64 bits all right so just a quick reminder where is the lib is used that is used whenever say the browser is downloading content because generally speaking the web service they will be serving the content using content code in gzip it's also used when you are decoding pages and it's also part of Chrome.net, which stands for Chromium Network Library, which is used by the majority of Android and Google Android applications. And what was really cool is that uh, after doing this optimization work, people were able to leverage those optimizations and enable some new user cases. I mentioned a few here, but I think the most interesting is this one. JavaScript source strings compression that was implemented by uh, uh, Benoit, which is a, a Google engineer. The basic idea is that when, say, you download uh, Facebook, lots of the JavaScript will not be executed right away. So those strings, they can take something like close to 12 megabytes of RAM. And you can compress those strings really well. So you know, by compressing that data, as soon as the page has finished loading, you can save something around 8 megabytes per tab, depending on the web page. Of course, if you have a web page that has no JavaScript, there is content to be compressed, right? Uh, OK. So after PNG was optimized and Zlib was optimized, we had one teammate, Jonathan Wright, to start optimizing uh, uh, JPEG. JPEG decoding is implemented by libjpeg turbo, which is already highly optimized. But even though um, they were already using uh, neon optimizations, um, Jonathan was able to find a few spots where we could make things even faster. And this work is still ongoing because it's twofold. The first step is to optimize the code, and the second step is to convert some of the uh, handwritten assembly to instead use intrinsics because that helps to improve the code health also allow us to have better uh, code generation depending on say what is your target but uh, what I think was really cool is that the <laughs> average performance gain was about 24 per percent and that was say in a huge uh, JPEG data corpus that is used uh, by Chromium developers to validate image decoding so that is a chart showing on this image called uh, corpus what was the gains. The red bar is for uh, B cores, the blue bar is for zero cores. So you can see that in some cases the performance gain was something like over 40%. That is for 64 bits, but in 32 bits it's pretty much the same thing. And so this is, I think, is quite, is a quite interesting uh, example where using Neo you can have something that will scale both up for big cores, as also down for little cores. Okay, so uh, last year I started looking into hashing, and oh, you guys may be familiar, but um, when say you are gonna be performing layout rendering of a web page, you have to perform text shaping. Text shaping is performed by Halfbus. Since it's an expensive operation, Blink has what's called a shape cache. And where basically you'll be, say, storing a cache of uh, a few words that have been shaped already. Just by changing the hash function that was used there by uh, something that was better. When, say, you load a web page like uh, Wikipedia, which has lots of words, so we're going to be performing lots of shaping. We had a gain of, say, 23% on ARM and about 19% on uh, x86. So next, I had a conversation with Benoit, and he mentioned that we were decompressing data faster on ARM than, say, calculating some cryptographic hashes, which I think was a little bit odd, because compression is, by definition, <coughs> branchy, and it's way more complex than, say, calculating a hash, even a cryptographic one. So I decided to have a look on a base uh, code inside of Chromium, and I noticed that uh, they were using a C implementation that uh, didn't uh, deploy the crypto extensions of ARM processors. So I 
initially wrote an implementation, then I noticed that Boring SSL had something similar. So I just decided to reuse Boring SSL, which uh, made us about 16 to 21 times faster for calculating SHA-1 cryptographic hash, which seems to help uh, on the time spent on um, V8 execute when you are rolling a web page, something around 9 to 10 percent. And then I started looking into the idea of, say, migrating the code base of Chromium from, say, the hash that's being used today to a better and faster hash. But that works a little bit, uh, I'll get there, is uh, challenging. Okay, just a um, chart showing what was uh, the performance boost by, say, instead of just using regular C, start using, say, the cryptographic instructions on ARM. So that was really cool because you see um, this Xeon workstation was from 2017 and this A72 processor was also from 2017. <coughs> so by using the cryptographic hashes, we were like uh, doing the computation actually faster than say a Xeon processor, which is not too shabby. And that is the speed. So say in an A76 processor that was like uh, made available in the market last December, we can calculate the SHA-1 cryptographic hash around 1.6 gigabytes per second, which is uh, pretty fast. Okay, so this is a uh, pinpoint run of a uh, experiment by uh, trying to replace the Chromium uh, hash by something that was faster. So that seemed to uh, give us like a uniform uh, improvement, in some cases up to 8% in the time spent doing layout. But this is just an experiment. It hasn't landed yet on Chromium, which leads us to some of the problems we are facing. So um, basically, most of the code today on Chromium is using a hash function called super fast hash, which is not that super, not that fast really. <laughs> So in an Intel processor, we will be able to hash data around 2 to 3 gigabytes per second. But we could use, as an example, a CD hash, which is going to be capable of doing something like 15 gigabytes per second. There is also a new hash now called XX hash version 3, which the same machine is going to be able to hash data around 16 gigabytes per second. Okay, problem is uh, there is some legacy code like UMA metrics where they rely on this old hash and we have some server side code that's going to be expecting to use the same old hash. Uh, there is also some cases where say I look into the GPU code, they're using the slower hash, they're replaced by the better one and suddenly there is an ATI bot that's broken. So progress on this area is, is moving a little bit slower than I really wanted, but I hope to uh, get this done. Maybe may take a little bit longer than I wanted, but uh, I think it might be pretty nice. Okay, so uh, when I was here two years ago, I had a nice conversation with Bedai Spabod, which is the half bus I'm maintainer, and I decided to have a look on track to make it a little bit faster. When you're doing text shape, lots of time spent doing a binary search. I came up with something that was branchless, was faster for little cores, but it was actually slower for big cores. Then I tried to unroll the operation, got into something that was faster for big cores, but it was actually slower for little cores. In the end, I noticed that uh, some time was being spent doing conversions between big engine format to little engine. We have instruction for that, it's the res 16. So just by deploying this instruction, that improved the time uh, spent doing layout between 8 to 11 percent. And I also noticed that half bus was being built inside of Chromium without optimizations enabled. So that was really nice, like, you know, if not the bug, enable optimizations, bam, gain it 10 times, 10 percent on the time spent doing layout of uh, pages. <laughs> so I think there is a valuable lesson here. Uh, is, it pays up to have a look on which kind of code has been generated and if, say, the optimizations are enabled, especially for, say, some components where performance is important. All right. Since we have done PNGs and we also have done JPEGs, the last missing format was GIF, which personally I don't like it much. 
<laughs> but a, uh, a friend, a teammate, uh, Tusha, he uh, was able to make a GIF decoding faster uh, by deploying two tricks. One was using wider uh, writes when you are decoding the data. The other one was uh, restructuring the tables used to perform the coding. That gave us on uh, the GIF uh, image corpus an average of 17%. You guys can see that in a few images we actually have a, a regression, but those images, they're really, really, really tiny, such that, say, when you try to perform a wide store, uh, you that didn't help performance. But um, the majority of the other cases where you have a GIF that is slightly bigger, and especially like for the bigger GIFs, we actually end up with an improvement of almost 50%. So you see now people can actually see uh, those uh, GIFs of cats way faster. Okay, so uh, next we move to uh, security and I will pass the word to uh, Dave. Cool, thank you. All right, so I think a lot of the browser security work probably happens at high levels in the stack. <laughs> So it's looking at things like JavaScript frameworks, uh, browser APIs, uh, that kind of thing. But obviously, um, we're interested in what can we do at the hardware level, right at the bottom of the stack, are the things we can do there to boost security. Um, I think it's particularly important for the browser, because obviously the browser is um, interacting all the time with untrusted data. So it's a major attack surface for your device. So we know that memory bugs are a really common source of browser attacks. Um, apparently it's actually two thirds of CVEs. Um, and control flow, control flow integrity, where an attacker is able to manipulate the execution of your program to make it execute code that you didn't want it to execute uh, is another Another attack source that we've kind of been able to work on. So recent iterations of the architecture have brought in a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about these first three things here. Pointer authentication, uh, memory tagging, and branch target identification. So first up, uh, talk about memory tagging. So this is primarily about protecting against buffer overflows, and use after free. Uh, the basic concept is you have a 64-bit pointer, so you've got some spare bits in that. You can use four of those bits to store a tag or a color that's associated with your pointer. Uh, and similarly, every 16-byte granule of memory has a color associated with it, independent of the pointer. So what's happening here is your allocator gives you a pointer to a block of memory, so you get a blue pointer to some blue memory, and you can use that pointer. If you try to access off the end of your buffer, you're using a blue pointer to access yellow memory, the hardware will detect that and can issue a fault. Uh, similarly, after you free the memory, you recolor it. Now you've got a blue pointer to green memory, and your use after free can be detected. Uh, you've got two modes of operation here. There's precise and imprecise. Uh, precise will give you a immediate synchronous fault, uh, whereas imprecise is asynchronous. It will be logged by the kernel. So that gives you a couple of or three deployment models. Uh, you can turn it on everywhere for the browsers that are in the field. So every browser in the field can be logging memory faults. It's very low overhead, so you can kind of build up data that says lots of people have seen uh, memory issues when they visit this website in this region of the code base. And you can sort of take that data and then go away and analyze the code base. Uh, for privileged software, for sensitive system services, you might choose to have precise checking where your service will just crash if there's a memory bug. And for debug, if you are debugging the browser um, as a developer, 
you can turn on precise mode and your debugger will break immediately if you have a use after free or a buffer overflow type of error. And again, you get a little bit of performance overhead, but for debug, that's probably acceptable. So we've done a, a little bit of prototyping of MTE, memory tagging. So in OilPan in Chromium, we were able to show that you can do this on a model, on a simulator. Um, you can do your testing, run all the unit tests, and prove that they behave in the way that you want, and you're able to catch um, errors. We're also able to take a look at what the memory impact is. So you get a small increase in memory usage because your objects uh, become 16 byte aligned and the headers increase slightly. Uh, but it's, it's quite a small impact. We also took a look at libjpeg turbo, uh, which is interesting because you've got a nested allocator there. So libjpeg turbo will receive tagged blocks of memory and it will then subdivide them and recolor them and use them within the JPEG Turbo. So it's a kind of more complex use case. And we're able to show that that works. And you don't really need to make very much changes. You don't, it's not very invasive. So next thing I want to talk about is pointer authentication. So this one is all about uh, defending against ROP attacks. So gadget-oriented programming. So this one is, it's a control flow integrity attack. Typically an attacker will use something like a buffer overflow to corrupt the stack. So once you've got a corrupted stack, that means your attacker has the ability to overwrite your return address. So they can force you to branch to any point in your existing program. So typically with a ROP attack, what you'll do is you'll branch to a point in the program just before a return instruction. So you'll execute a couple of instructions that do what you want. The return instruction brings you back to where you were, back to your corrupted stack, and then the next corrupted stack location can take you to another couple of instructions. And if you chain enough of these gadgets together, you can get um, arbitrary behavior out of your program. So pointer authentication is a mitigation against this. Uh, what it does is on function entry, you cryptographically sign your return address with a key that's not accessible to user space. So in practice, it looks like this. as your function prolog. So at the very start of the function, you sign uh, your x30, your return address. So that's now modified. Um, and then you, at the end of your function, just before you return, you validate that signature. If that has been corrupted, then you will get an illegal address exception here. So you can uh, detect that the stack has been corrupted and prevent this sort of attack. So it gives you a defense against malicious input data. Um, if people are trying to craft, for example, corrupt images, malformed images, such that they're designed to overflow buffers and so on, it can give you protection against that kind of thing. And web browsers are seen as a kind of significant use case for this sort of technology. It is almost just a compiler flag. Uh, you do have to modify your stack unwinding code. So obviously, in order to walk the stack and generate a stack trace, you need to understand that your return addresses have been modified. Um, if you want this protection in your JIT compiler, you need to modify your JIT compiler. But otherwise, again, impact is minimal. It's quite non-invasive. Uh, one thing that has been done is it's been encoded into the NOP space, which means that old hardware will execute these new instructions and <coughs> won't actually do anything with them. It will just ignore them. So you can have a single binary that picks up this new capability on new hardware 
that is fine on old hardware. And in prototyping, we've seen it's quite low overhead, maybe a couple of percent at most. Finally, um, BTI is kind of a complement to pointer auth. Um, so the, the difference here is pointer authentication uh, is a mechanism for stopping an attacker from branching into gadgets, stops you from calling a gadget. Uh, whereas branch target identification is perhaps about restricting what can actually be a gadget. So pointer auth stops you making that jump. Branch target identification limits the places where your branches can land. So we have a new BTI instruction, also known as a landing pad. And the basic concept is this instruction is the only thing that can be a target of an indirect branch. Um, so again, it's almost just a compiler flag. If you have assembly code, you'll probably need to insert some manual instructions. But otherwise, just turn on the compiler flag. Again, it's in NOP space, so old hardware will just ignore these landing pad instructions. And the combined benefit of these is substantial. So we did a study on glibc, uh, looking for gadgets of 10 instructions or fewer. If you combine those, you get maybe an 80 times reduction in potential gadgets. So it massively limits uh, what an attacker can, can do with this kind of technique. So to summarize, um, we've got these three new security features. Uh, each one of them requires a little bit of work in different areas in the browser. Um, but none of them are invasive. Uh, they're all quite low impact. And as a kind of benefit of doing this work, uh, you get a huge reduction in your attack surface and you get the ability to detect memory bugs uh, before they can be exploited. So that, that's the dream. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for us? We'd be interested to hear if there are areas that people know about that they'd like to see more optimization work done on ARM. Yeah. Um, or, or just generally, you know, areas where we could be helping the browser. Security and performance are sort of the obvious too, but yeah. we're open to ideas. Yeah, so basically, if, say, you guys are aware of, say, a specific subsystem that is, um, let's just say, could, could be faster, let us know. We'll be more than happy to work together. So, questions? Yes. Actually, uh, how do you identify the places where we have to go for the optimization? Yes. How do you identify the hot, hot spots for the uh, targets for the optimization? Okay, that, that's actually a really good question. Because, yeah, so the question was how you identify the hot spots. Well, the issue is everyone here knows that Chromium is a massive code base, right? I mean, it takes forever to build. I think last time I counted was over 30 million lines of code. So if you think about it, it's actually even worse than the Linux kernel, because generally a kernel with the minimal set of drivers is going to be something like 4 million lines of code. Okay, so basically um, our approach is we start by, say, loading a few web pages that we consider them important. We collect, say, a perf trace. And we try to isolate, say, uh, which parts might be uh, good candidates for optimization. Uh, we start by, say, initially optimizing PNG. And when, say, I collected the trace on, on decoding a PNG, I saw that there were, like, hotspots inside of libpng, hotspots inside of Blink, and lots of hotspots inside of Zillab. And JPEG was something similar. But, um, and then GIF just felt natural, right? But, um, I mean, that is generally the way we, we do it. And sometimes it's like word of the mill. 
So as an example, uh, the SHA-1 cryptographic hash, I just talked to a uh, Chrome developer and he mentioned that that was slow. So I decided to have a look on it and then I made it 21 times faster. And another example was the case of uh, uh, half bus. I talked to uh, Beda and I understood that there was something important. Then I had a quick look on, on it and then we found some optimization opportunities. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit of safe profiling plus talking with people. So you have your own tools to do that? These are specific tools which... Uh... Yes, but those are highly secret, so I cannot <laughs> show you. No, no, I'm just um, joking. We're just It's primarily perf. things like perf. Yeah. So there is an ARM profiler, um, but typically we, yeah, typically just perf. Yeah, so, I mean, if say you have an ARM board and you came around perf, you should be good to go. So like, the person should know the ARM uh, instructions to optimize the, the target, whatever you want. You found that the VPN is not um, giving the performance. So to optimize it, you should know the how the ARM instruction will save it? Yes, so, okay. So, uh, some optimizations will use specific instructions. So, as an example, SHA-1 will have a specific instruction for that, CRC-32, it's the same case. In other cases, say, for example, uh, the libpng pallet optimization that was implemented using NEO instructions. NEO instructions, they are what call, people call uh, SIM instructions, which is like single uh, instruction with four multiple data or vectorial uh, vector instructions. Um, there is some documentation on ARM's uh, website concerning Neon, and also there are some manuals uh, giving some uh, information about, say, optimization for specific uh, processor models. Uh, unfortunately, the information is a little bit not really organized. Yeah, it's something that they're continuing to work on. Yes, I mean, there is a group that's trying to build, say, a common uh, website with all the information together. But uh, yes, I mean, if, say, you want to optimize for ARM, you have to understand the architecture and you have to know the instructions. And you have to be willing to spend lots of hours writing the same code again and again different ways to try to find the fastest one. I would say it's a little bit of, say, uh, I would say it's a little bit of a trial and error. Because even sometimes you may end up with something that is faster for, say, a specific core, it may not be that great for other cores. So we also have to validate optimizations in a few um, ARM boards to make sure that we find something that is going to work well everywhere. Yeah, I think one of the key things is just having an ARM board that you can profile on. Yep. Um, you know, just, just knowing ARM architecture, if you don't have the hardware to test, won't, won't help you. And if, if you don't know the architecture, but you can test it, you can probably get there. Yeah, but I would say, while a couple of years ago, an ARM board where you could run, say, Linux and have perf working would cost a lot. In these days, you have like little boards that cost like 100 bucks, where you can get, say, a Ubuntu run on it. So I would say today, yeah, the ecosystem is way more friendly for developers, I think. Questions? Yes. You mentioned a lot of optimizations in different conversion libraries. Are these optimizations now the upstream? Upstream in Chromium? Or okay. still downstream? Okay, that's a good question. Right, so um, the optimizations for compression library, in this case Zlib, are they upstream? And if they are upstream, they are really upstream, right? Okay. So the issue is, um, Zlib is maintained by a researcher called Mark Adler. He has been maintaining Zlib since 95, right? So he's been providing good service for the community for the last 24 years. And he has, I don't know, last year he has retired. And uh, I noticed that for the last uh, 15 years, they didn't accept any kind of performance optimizations on canonical Zlib. So the way we found to start shipping those optimizations was by uh, landing those chains on Chromium, Zlib. 
such that there is like a common place where if say people want to have a look on those optimizations, they can just check out the code. I mean, my dream would be that someday Canonical Sleep would accept those patches, but uh, my merge request is open for over two years, I think, and uh, still uh, no signs of it being accepted. But uh, LibJ, uh, but on the other hand, LibPNG has accepted the palette optimization. LibJPEG Turbo, we are talking with the maintainer. Yeah, so LibJPEG Turbo is a similar story actually to Zlib. So what we've done is Chromium has made a fork of LibJPEG Turbo, um, and we've got a load of performance patches into that. We want to get those patches ultimately into the canonical upstream of LibJPEG Turbo, at which point Chromium will pick that up and drop its own fork. So for now, Chromium's fork is sort of a temporary thing to get the performance. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I've, I mean, personally speaking, we want to have all the, the optimizations in the canonical project, but sometimes that is not possible. Questions? So not so much of a like, optimization question, but more, so when I need to debug on, on R, it's usually much harder than like on XM6, because we don't have like all the tools that we have there. Mm -hmm. Part of it is not like obviously the architecture's fault, like Android Studio just kind of sucks. But for like, as far as I know, there are some limitations with ARM where like you cannot have like nice things like RR or that kind of stuff working. Do you know if there's any work to address that? So there is a reverse debugger for ARM. That's, RR is a reverse debugger, right? Yeah. yeah, so I know of one called undo, and I think the developers of that use V8 as their primary development test case. Um, I've not used it myself, so I can't tell you any more about it. Well, you know, there is a, there, I think it's an important point. Uh, I think it was in 2016 in a Linaro Connect, Linus Tovold said that the architecture is a detail, what matters is the developer ecosystem. So, I mean, I would, I would, I would say that three years ago it was impossible to get, say, a, a laptop running an ARM processor where you could, say, work as a, use it as a developer machine. But, I mean, we are moving towards getting that, you know. Uh, my dream is that one day I will have a workstation running an ARM processor where I'll build Chrome, and then I'll have my laptop run an ARM processor, where I'll do all my developing work. We're not there yet, but I hope that eventually we'll get there. Do you know the name of the reverse debugger? Yeah, sorry, it's called Undo. Or at least the company's called Undo. I think the product is called Undo. <laughs> Questions? Okay, so I think we're... Oh wait, there's one more question. Oh, there's one question. Um, it's a question about the memory timing um, mm -hmm. thing. Um, so it's called the, um, the memory operation. Uh, I thought I was just wondering uh, how effective you found it in catching bugs. Were you able to turn on the precise check and find uh, upper overflows and things like that? So, so far we've only been able to run it on a model. So we, it's an architectural feature that's been sort of designed and announced, but no one's built it yet. Um, so that limits how much testing we've been able to do. So, no, we haven't been able to find anything yet. I think, hopefully, we'll see a lot of impact if it's people are able to deploy it in the field and get sort of millions of data points coming back. Um, so, basically, we expect to have Silicon with those features in what, like two years or something? Um, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. Probably some point in the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, those are like some new features. Uh, I think it's, it's relevant for the kind of people here to be aware that there are some new features coming. So, um, but it's not like you can have like real silicon today to test that. Questions? Okay, so well, thanks for your time. Thank you.